And there are people who are trying to promote uh, brain surgery for addiction using electrical stimulation of that area. And it doesn't work any better than methadone. Um, and that's not to say that methadone isn't the most useful drug we currently have, but it does not in involve invasive surgery. Um, and uh, I should say methadone and buprenorphine, um, the opioid agonists, are the best treatments that we have for opioid addiction. And what they do is two things. The first thing is they cut the death rate by 50%, which this happens whether you continue using on top or not. Um, so that's like sheer harm reduction, and that's wonderful. If we can keep you alive long enough that um, you stabilize your life, that is a lot better than having you die. Um, the other thing that they do is um, they allow people who are ready to stabilize their lives. So you couldn't tell right now if I was on a maintenance treatment or not, because basically once you get a tolerance to these drugs, you are not high or impaired and you can drive and you can work and you can love and you can do all of these things. What we don't understand is we think, oh, you've just substituted one addiction for another. No, what you've done is you've substituted compulsive behavior despite negative consequences and now you just have physical dependence and that's not a real problem as long as you have a safe and legal supply. I think the most important place to start is that addiction is a learning disorder. It's not a sign that you are a bad person and if you want to have a safe and addiction free or at least lower level addiction uh, workplace or school you want people to feel included and comfortable and safe, and you don't want this to be an adversarial thing. Um, the research shows that the best way to get people help is through compassion and empathy and support, and absolutely not tough love. Um, there may be situations in which an employer has to fire somebody because their performance is just degraded so much that there's no other option, but they shouldn't think I'm doing them a favor by firing them because that will make them hit bottom and it will help them. Sometimes that happens, but sometimes they just go on to a life of homelessness and then die. Um, so you can't assume that creating extra negative consequences is actually going to help a person with addiction. What you want to do is is ally yourself with them and presuming this is an employee that you want to keep um help you know help them realize that this is not a sin i am not trying to control you um what i want to do is for you to be at your best at work at home um and you're not being at your best right now so what can we do to um help well, I think the important way to start that conversation is to first not assume that a problem that you think might be drugs is drugs. Um, the person could be having any number of mental illness, um, any number of mental illnesses. The person could be having, um, you know, there's a million things that could look like, oh, you think they have a drug problem and there's something else going on. So if you approach the person with respect and not assuming that you're going to find a drug thing unless you know i mean obviously in some situations it's completely obvious but um in most situations it isn't and so the best way i think is to say i've noticed xyz i'm worried about you i'm concerned about you i want you know to make sure that um i can help you um, so if it comes from a place of not like, I caught you, you know, <laughs> um, uh, you know, because there's so much advice that is just like, you know, well, threaten to fire them if they don't change and drug test them immediately and all of this kind of stuff, which destroys trust. Um, you know, so that's not to say that if somebody is doing something dangerous, um, or clearly, you know, inappropriate that that behavior doesn't need to be addressed. Um, but it is to say that you can um, approach somebody in a confrontational, degrading, and sort of high-powered uh, manner, or you can approach them as an equal human being deserving of respect. And if you do the latter, you will have much better results.
Well, and I, and I have to say, it's almost never going to be easy um, because people, um, whether they have addiction or mental illness or anything else going on with them, often don't want to admit to themselves that there's a problem. And, you know, in the addictions field, there's been this whole thing, we got to break through denial and everything like that. Well, people have denial for good reasons. If we didn't have denial, everybody would be sitting around obsessing about death. Um, or at least I would be. <laughs> uh, you know, it's a, it's a defense mechanism because we need defending. So recognizing that um, can allow you to approach somebody not from an attacking stance, approach somebody from a befriending sort of stance. And that is hard to do, and some people are gonna get very defensive no matter what you do, um, and it's not going to be a pleasant conversation most of the time, but you can, make, you can minimize harm. I mean, the, this whole thing always comes down to like reducing harm, making things less unpleasant if you can't make them non-unpleasant um, or actually pleasant. Um, you know, the, so it's, it's really, um, but the main thing is like, see them as a full human being. And I think really important in getting people into any kind of treatment is that, I, and I always say this to parents or anybody who has an addicted loved one, the first step should always be a complete, thorough psychiatric evaluation by somebody who is not affiliated with any treatment organization um, so that you can know going in what the problems may be and what kind of services you should be seeking. Um, you know, there are some absolutely wonderful treatment providers who, if somebody shows up who is not appropriate for their services, they will send them away. There are also, unfortunately, many people who will just take that person to make profit off of them. And they will not help that person and they will not inform them that, for example, if they stayed on maintenance, they would have a 50% reduction in their death risk. They would just say, we do abstinence, that's good for you, blah. You know, um, and so um, I think, you know, again, this is a sort of buyer beware industry. Um, in the rest of medicine, it's pretty easy to say, okay, here's PubMed, this is the treatment for this particular cancer that you know has the most um, evidence behind it, um, and here's the guy who designed the best treatment, let's go find this person. In addiction, it's like all, virtually all based on like reputation and advertising, and um, it is, you know, it is very difficult to actually find programs that provide evidence-based care. Um, this is also a problem in mental health more generally, um, but anyway, the, the point here is, is that in order to get care that is good for you, you need to advocate for yourself. And if you have an employer that's willing to advocate for you, that's even better. Um, the way I think that um, employers could do an enormous amount of good by demanding that the treatment providers they work with, um, the treatment that they cover is evidence-based and is um, not restricted because of um, money, but is restricted because stuff that doesn't work shouldn't be paid for.